Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember, to support this channel, please subscribe. The Remarkable Yet Tragic Life and Death of Anne Boleyn Anne Boleyn is one of the most divisive figures in British history. Everyone wants to know how she really felt and how and why she became Queen. Was her death simply a tragic consequence of court politics or was she a ruthless schemer? We will never really know. Sadly, there has been virtually nothing left of Anne Boleyn from her own time and all of history is written through a writer's prejudice or leap of imaginative fantasy. All the surviving portraits of her were created during the reign of her daughter, Elizabeth I. After her death, all that relates to her was sadly removed or destroyed, lost in time. We do not know the exact date when Anne was born, but it is believed that she was born roughly in the year 1500. She was the daughter of Sir Thomas Bolin and Elizabeth Howard. Sir Thomas was a respected courtier and Elizabeth was the daughter of Sir Thomas Howard, one of the most powerful men in the country. Due to there being no surviving contemporary portraits of Anne, impartial descriptions of her are hard to find. It is thought that she had dark hair and eyes and a slender neck, but we know little about her personality. Anne's childhood was spent at Hever Castle in Kent and her adolescence at the French court. She was originally a companion to Henry VIII's sister, Mary, who was married to Louis XII. It is thought that Henry may have first encountered Anne when she arrived back to England in 1522. Anne took one of the lead roles, Perseverance, in a court mask in March at Thomas Wolseley's residence in Whitehall. Anne certainly had lots of admirers when she returned to England, and this seems to have been partly due to her glamorous French fashion. Both Henry Percy, later the Earl of Northumberland, and the poet Thomas Wyatt courted Anne, but these acquaintances seem to have remained within the accepted boundaries of flirtatious courtly love and romantic poetry. But in 1526, the king's interest significantly upped the stakes. By the mid-1520s, Henry had become increasingly desperate for a legitimate son and heir to secure the Tudor dynasty's future. Henry VIII's long marriage to Catherine of Aragon had only produced one surviving child, Princess Mary, so Henry was now looking for a solution. History dictates that Henry originally courted Anne as a prospective mistress, but that Anne refused. Was she driven by her own virtue or ambition, or was she driven by her scheming relatives and aware of the king's dilemma? Whatever the reason, Anne held out for the possibility of marriage. Over the next couple of years, Anne and Henry corresponded via letters. Seventeen of these letters survived and are in the Vatican Library. They detail Henry's growing infatuation and one explicitly declares that the king's heart belongs to Anne alone and that he hoped his body would soon also. Henry signed the letter with a love heart around Anne's initials but only Henry's letters have survived. In the year 1527, the king began looking for a political and legal solution to end his marriage with Catherine of Aragon. Catherine was a pious and proud queen who believed that her marriage to Henry VIII was a sacred institution. She was not going to meekly accept her fate. If she had, then English history may have turned out rather differently. The king petitioned the Pope that their marriage had never been legitimate because he had sinned in taking his brother's widow. Thomas Wolseley was charged with procuring the divorce but he failed, destroying his own career in the process because the Pope refused to give in to Henry's demands. Legend has it that Anne was the person who suggested a solution. Perhaps driven by her own reformist faith, she gave Henry a copy of William Tynesdale's Obedience of a Christian Man. The book argued that supreme authority was not held by the Pope, but by the words of the Bible that God had enshrined. This then pushed Henry into defying the Pope, 
in 1531 and he dismissed Catherine. Anne and Henry were then finally married in January of 1533 and she was crowned queen in Westminster Hall on the 1st of June. Anne and Henry's marriage was technically bigamous until the annulment of his marriage to Catherine in the May of 1533. It was then the following year when Henry broke with the Roman Catholic Church and set himself up as the head of what would then become the Church of England. This act alone created shockwaves that caused religious and political unrest in Britain for the next 200 years. Anne was a big supporter of Henry's new religious and political policies and gathered around them a new team of rising courtiers. This included the likes of Thomas Cromwell and Thomas Cramner. From the little information passed down through the centuries, one thing we do know is that Anne was active in promoting new educational identities for monasteries as they were no longer under the protection of the Catholic Church. Anne was also the royal patron of the great court artist Hans Holbein, who designed an arch for her coronation and a rose water fountain. On the 7th of September, Anne and Henry's first child was born, a healthy daughter who grew up to become Elizabeth I. For the birth of Elizabeth, Anne chose Greenwich Palace, but she had to follow the strict rules laid down for royal mothers to be, where confinement was literally that. Anne was sent in a suite of rooms which included a great chamber, a birthing chamber, and a small chapel with a front in case her newborn ailed and needed to be baptised immediately. All males, including the king, were excluded, and the women then took on the traditional male duties, such as those of pantry men and butlers. Anne would have been escorted by high-born ladies to an oppressively dark and stuffy bedchamber, with large tapestries covering the walls, ceilings and even the windows. Every tiny crack and gap that could let in an ounce of light was blocked off or covered, and a thick carpet would have been laid on the ground. There, in the chamber, was a great bed with fine linen sheets and feather-stuffed pillows, and alongside were two cradles. One was the formal state cradle, upholstered in red and gold, and the other, a cradle of tree, carved from wood and painted gold. The room would have been stuffy and claustrophobic with burning scented oils in the air. The rules dictate that confinement should begin four to six weeks before the expected date of delivery. And it is thought, going by the date Elizabeth was born, that Anne was already pregnant before she and Henry got married. After the birth of her daughter, Anne, sadly, suffered from two miscarriages one in 1534 and the other in 1536 and it is thought that these may have led the always spiritually superstitious Henry to doubt whether he had made the right choice in marrying Anne. Maybe the sad fact that Anne bared no more children was the start of her downfall or maybe it was something to do with the promising new foreign allegiance with the Holy Roman Empire floundered because the Emperor, Charles V, refused to ratify the Bolin marriage. Hostile factions gathered in the wings, led by all those courtiers who had lost their influence during the Bolin change of regime. Thomas Wolseley, too, resented Anne's influence over the King, calling her the Night Crow pouring into his ear at night. Many people sympathised with King Henry's first wife, Catherine. Even during Anne's coronation procession in 1533, one eyewitness claimed that people lining the route looked as sorry as though it had been a funeral. Ultimately, Henry and Anne's relationship, built on passion and expectation, seemed to have developed into a relationship that was characterised by strong and conflicting emotions. Henry, again, began to look outside his marriage for solutions. Historians through the years believe that Anne was an innocent woman framed, framed by Henry VIII's loyal servant Thomas Cromwell. It is thought that Anne disagreed with Cromwell's plans for the monasteries and Anne's pro-French stance on diplomacy would have been detrimental to Cromwell's hoped alliance with the Holy Roman Empire. 
It is also thought to be true that Anne's almoner had attacked Cromwell. Another theory is that Henry himself framed Anne so that he could then marry his third wife, Jane Seymour. The charges include adultery, incest and conspiracy against the king. All charges are believed to be false accusations to enable Henry VIII to then marry again and produce a male heir to the throne. Anne was thought to be clashing with Cromwell on matters of foreign policy and the king's finances. Cromwell, thought to have then facilitated Anne's demise and most certainly acted on behalf of the king's wishes. Cromwell was parted to a secret commission, one that included Anne's father, who one would assume tried to warn her, but at this point there was very little she could do. Anne was accused of sexual affairs with male members of the court, some whom were tortured into making confessions, as well as being accused of incest with her own brother and using sorcery to bewitch the king. Anne was then sent to confinement at the Tower of London and her trial took place on the 15th of May 1536. The jury knew what was expected of them in a case of high treason, a case of six people conspiring to kill God's anointed sovereign, Anne, her brother George Boleyn, Lord Rochford, Sir Henry Norris, groom of the stall, courtiers Sir Francis Weston and William Bereston, and musician Mark Smeaton, had little hope of justice. Imperial Ambassador Eustace Chapwee, in his dispatch regarding the trial of the four men, wrote that they were condemned upon presumption and certain indications without valid proof or confession. No witnesses were produced against Anne and her brother either, and they defended themselves admirably, with George being described as replying so well to the charges that several of those present wagered ten to one that he would be acquitted. It was no good, though. On the morning of the 19th of May, 1536, Sir William Kingston accorded Queen Anne Boleyn from her apartments in the Tower's Royal Palace, the same apartments where she had stayed before her coronation in 1533, to the scaffold. On the scaffold, Anne made a simple speech, sticking to execution protocol. Good Christian people, I have not come here to preach a sermon. I have come here to die. For according to the law, and by the law, I am judged to die, and therefore I will speak nothing against it. I am come hither to accuse no man, nor to speak of that whereof I am accused and condemned to die. But I pray God save the king, and send him long to reign over you. For gentler nor a more merciful prince was there never, and to me he was ever a good, a gentle, and sovereign lord." and if any person will meddle of my cause, I require them to judge the best, and thus I take my leave of the world and of you all, and I heartily desire you all to pray for me. The executioner beheaded the queen with one stroke of his sword, then her distressed ladies wrapped Anne's remains in a white cloth and carried them to the nearby chapel of St. Peter ad Vincula. Nobody had thought to provide a coffin for her burial, so a yeoman wanderer had to fetch an old elm chest, which had once contained bow staves from a tower's armoury. Anne's head and body were placed in the chest and buried in the chancel near to the remains of her brother, Lord Rochford. By sending Anne to her death, Henry cleared the path to enable him to marry Jane Seymour, a marriage that took place only days after Anne died, an act carried out by a French swordsman who was thought to have been sent for even before Anne was found guilty at the trial. Henry showed Anne a small mercy by granting her request to die by sword rather than axe, if one could call being executed at all merciful. Anne was then known as Anne of a Thousand Days, and most unbiased descriptions are hard to find, as most were written after her death. She was effectively written out of the history books for the rest of Henry's reign and that of his son. Anne's name was literally chiselled out of the fabric at Hampton Court and her badges and heraldry replaced by those of Jane Seymour. Catherine of Aragon's daughter, Mary I, promoted the view of Anne as a heretical seductress who had destroyed her mother and corrupted her father away from the true religion of Roman Catholicism. 
and Anne's daughter, Elizabeth I, resurrected her mother's role in establishing the Anglican Church. Still to this day, historians continue to battle over Anne Boleyn's reputation. Thank you for watching and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.